tired of messy closets, you need the reorganizer. True love doesn't mean having to break the bank. Give her Diamonds by Jean Frog. Suds away! Strong enough to fight the toughest stains, but gentle enough to shampoo this kitty. Not even really working, is it? Don't just sit there. Change your life. Change your life. It'll change your life, or I'll give you your money back. Guaranteed. Not an actual guarantee. Results may vary. Offer void where prohibited. Not available in all areas. Talk to your doctor about possible side effects. Use at your own risk. Supplies are limited. Order today. Uh, uh, I got some on me. Uh, 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 uh. So sometimes it seems just too good to be true, right? Today we were singing about the name of Jesus, and we want to focus on some gifts that he gives to us in this series that if you just look at it on the surface, you go, that's too good to be true. But it's not too good to be true. And today I'm going to invite you to open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4. We're going to examine two verses, uh, chapter 4 verses, actually, excuse me, three verses, verses 9 through 11, and talk about something that Jesus offers to all of us that seems too good to be true, but it's not. Before we do that, I'm excited to be able to announce, David Loveless alluded to it just a second ago, but we have selected the date based on his health and everything else, and Pastor David will be preaching on September 13th. It's the weekend that he's coming back to preach. And we are so excited for that. I want you to make plans to be here. If you're already here in the room, please put that on your calendar. All the weekends between now and then are good too, but you want to be sure and be here uh, for that weekend. And if you're watching us today, maybe that would be a weekend you want to come join us. Uh, it'll be a, a really spectacular day. David has some things to share uh, about his recent journey and some things God has shown him. And I want to encourage you to be here September 13th to hear uh, from Pastor David. Uh, the plan right now is that he'll be live in all three services on Sunday morning. So I want to encourage you uh, to be here on September 13th. Uh, I also want to just say a word during this season of incredible uncertainty for us. Um, you have been so gracious as a church family. You've been so gracious to me and to the rest of the church staff. And I just can't tell you your encouragement, your comments, your support, your financial support, your attendance, your participating online. It's just been a blessing to all of us. And on behalf of all of the staff, let me tell you how thankful we are for a wonderful, gracious church family that you are. You love us and you demonstrate that to us all the time. So thank you for that. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. We're talking today about the idea of rest. Jesus offers us rest. Verse 9, I'll read it aloud. You follow along from your device or even on the screen. It says this, So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. So we are invited, Jesus is inviting us to rest, to experience rest. In this season especially, but just in our culture, rest is elusive. It's not something that is easy to find. It's not a, um, something that is easy to experience. Rest is not. Um, the dictionary says rest is to cease work or movement in order to relax and refresh oneself or to recover strength. It's hard to find rest, and there's physical rest, emotional rest, spiritual rest. They're hard to find and hard to experience. Part of that's just the, the pace that we operate at. And you know, it always hasn't been this way. And, and I'm not talking about just COVID season. I'm just saying in general, in our Western culture, it is just foot on the gas pedal all the time. And, and the, the advances in technology... I'm not sure that they've helped us. It's just made the expectations on us that much greater. Uh, how, how much more we have to do. Back when I was in college, 
and I wanted to communicate to my parents, I would write a letter. Hey, Mom, thanks for the care package. I'm healthy. Everything's going well at school. I'm wearing my mask. I'm washing my hands. Can you send me some money in your next letter? That would, that would be a, a letter, and we'd actually put it in the mailbox, and it'd you know, go by the postal service and be delivered, and then they'd read it and write it. Well, then email came along. And that was a lot more efficient. I think, wow, I can do this, and she's going to get it today. And I'd send her the same thing, and the same day she'd get it. Now, this was back. I wasn't in college anymore. Obviously, this has come much later. And then, you know what? Then that technology wasn't fast enough for us. And I can remember my kids were in high school or middle school when they started texting. And I'm thinking, nobody will ever do that. Use a phone to write. You'll never do that. Was I ever wrong, right? And so then it was texting, and it's immediate, back and forth, and we're learning how to say sentences shorter and, and use phrases and abbreviations, and the way we spell things is all different. But that's gotten too long. Now everything is done through an emoji. We're doing nothing but sending pictures. That says the same thing my first letter said right there. Thanks for the care package, and I'm washing my hands and wearing a face mask. Can you send money? It's saying the same thing. How, how we have changed. And it's not bought us any rest. In fact, it's done the exact opposite. I can never escape every turn, every day from the moment my eyes open up until sometimes even asleep I hear it buzz and I feel, I gotta, I gotta know what it's saying. Rest is elusive. And Jesus offers us rest. And I know it seems too, too good to be true, but it's not too good to be true. We can experience rest. The rest we desire and that we know we need, we can experience if we understand the keys to it. And we're going to look at some of those keys today in this passage. First key, we can find rest if we know the sequence of rest. What's the sequence of of rest. Look with me at verse 9. It says this, so then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. That term Sabbath rest, it, it, this is the only place it appears in the New Testament, Sabbath rest, Sabbath rest. The writer coined the phrase. It's something that he made up for what the purposes he would make it. So what does it mean? Uh, commentators aren't exactly sure, but it seems to me the preponderance of evidence is that the Sabbath rest is a way for the writer to say a rest that's patterned after the rest of God, after the Sabbath of God. It's patterned after the way God rested or the, God, the way God created rest. In other words, there's a rhythm to the rest and the rhythm to life that God created in creation. And we can find rest when we begin to know and understand and follow this sequence of rest. So what is the sequence. How does it work? Well, you know, in creation, the creation story, for six days God created, and then he did what? He rested. Six days of work, one day of rest. But pay close attention. What day did he create mankind? He created mankind on day six. So God's seventh day was man's first day. And man began with what? With work? No, with rest. God created, then rested. He created man to rest and then work. Rest comes before work. Do you know that he even created that in the way the Hebrew culture counted and experienced their days? If you know somebody that practices the Jewish faith, you know that their Sabbath begins on Friday night at sundown. Their days begin in the evening. So Sabbath begins in the evening and goes till the next evening. Their regular day schedule, they, the way they count their days, it begins in the evening and, and follows through till the next evening. We Westerners, we Americans, and most of the world today, we begin our days with what? Sunrise, right? That's the beginning. It's like we got to work and then we get to rest. God's sequence is rest and then work. And do you know that it's, it's that pattern, it's that sequence that God has for us physically, but it's also emotionally, and it's spiritually. We rest first. That sequence, and, and even the sequence of how we get healthy spiritually, emotionally, and physically, 
the sequence is it doesn't start with the physical. It starts with the spiritual. It's as we get healthy spiritually, then we can have the strength and the, the wherewithal and the, the help that we need, the, the, the strength in, internally to deal with what we're dealing with emotionally. And then and only then are we able to find sleep. You know, I guess you have been reading like I have in these days of COVID, sleep has been elusive to a lot of people, even though we've been, especially early on, we're home a lot more and seem like you could sleep more. But in fact, sleep, physical sleep has been elusive for a lot of people. I don't know if it's watching too much TV and too many shows, but people are dreaming more than they've dreamed before, more nightmares than what they had before, more anxiety and, and depression and anxiousness about life. The physical and the emotional is elusive. And it's even more elusive when we don't have the spiritual rest that God offers to us. The pattern that Jesus established, the pattern that God established is rest first, then work. Spiritual first, then it gets to physical. Understanding the sequence is part of the key to, to finding rest for ourselves. Well, the second key is found in verse 10. And the second key is we can find rest by using some practices for rest. We can find rest by using some practices. Verse 10 says this, For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God rested from his. And so he, there's a double thing there. He says, you've entered God's rest, but you still get to rest from what you have to do. There's a sense in which those of us who are following Jesus, we've, he's saying we have entered into rest, so we have this resting relationship. We're going to talk about that in just a second. But we have this resting relationship, but we also get to rest from the work that we do. What are the works that we do? We don't know for sure, but I think it encompasses all works. The good works that we do to display our love for Jesus, I think he also means just from regular work, from the toil of the day. It just because we have the spiritual rest doesn't mean we don't also need the other rest as well. So Jesus, and the New Testament doesn't teach on this, and Jesus doesn't really teach on this, but we can glean from the pattern of Jesus' own life how important this was to him. I just looked through the Gospel of Mark, who, by the way, articulates this more than the other Gospel writers. But if you just look at the Gospel of Mark and, and, and the way he describes Jesus finding a way to find rest, here's what it says in Mark 1.35. It says, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place. Mark 1.45, Jesus withdrew to a lonely place. Mark 2.13, Jesus went out beside the lake. Mark 3.7, Jesus withdrew with his disciples. Mark 3.13, Jesus went on a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. Jesus, uh, excuse me, Mark 4.1, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Mark 6.31-32, he, Jesus says, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away with themselves in a boat to a solitary place. Mark 6, 46, he went up to a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. Mark 8, 27, once when Jesus was praying in private um, and his disciples were with him. Mark 9, 2, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up to a high mountain where they were all alone. You get the pattern? Jesus is escaping the crowds and the noise and all the things that people want to do with, with him. And he's getting alone. And he's going to a solitary place. I studied that word solitary place and alone. Do you know what it means? It means he left his cell phone back. Okay? It means he was alone. He found a place of quiet to rest his soul, to get to a place where he could calm his spirit. And this is a pattern that Jesus shows us over and over again, and it, it's a practice that we should be putting into place as well. John Eldridge has written a, a, a book that talks about this, and he, he um, has what he calls the one-minute pause, and in fact, he's created an app I downloaded a couple weeks ago, and i got to tell you, I've used it, and it's, it's helpful. It's called the Pause App. And you set when you want to be reminded, and a little reminder comes up and says it's time to pause in your day and to take a breath and get alone. Think about the things that are going on and contemplate 
all the things coming at you and maybe say a word of prayer about what's coming ahead or where you've been. And there's something about getting a break and stepping away, getting out of the noise that is kind of refreshing and helpful. John also talks about um, something he calls benevolent detachment. It's the ability to disconnect yourself from the pressures around you. And it's a, it's a process whereby you, the only way to escape the tensions and pressures and problems that we have is to give them to somebody. And benevolent detachment is when we verbalize and articulate our, we're cutting the cord, we're detaching ourselves from the things that we can't control and we're giving them to God. John uses a phrase, I give everyone and everything to you, God. I give everyone and everything to you, God. In this moment of pause, in the, the one-minute pause, he has benevolent detachment where he has permission, God's gracious permission to detach ourselves from the pressures that we, we don't understand and we can't deal with, to say, I give everything and everyone to you. Only you can deal with it. It is right and appropriate as believers to receive this wonderful gift that God has offered to us. And it's not too good to be true. It is true. He offers us rest and the chance to take a pause and breathe and not have to respond and not have to solve the problems of the day, but to experience benevolent detachment. I give everything. And everyone to you. Everything and everyone to you. Personally, I have to tell you, I have found in my own journey, nothing can take the place of solitude and quiet in my own intimate personal relationship with God. I gain a lot from church services and reading and learning from the Bible together and worshiping and singing together. That enriches my life. I have some Folks in a small group that I connect with and doing life in a small group helps me a lot and enriches my spiritual walk and challenges me. People who know me have a great relationship with my wife, with Betsy, around spiritual things. And we talk about God working in our lives on a regular basis. It's a part of our vernacular, a part of our experience. But there's nothing like just me and God. Just us talking, me listening and experiencing the grace that God has for me. Betsy and I love to go out to eat with people. We love to go out to eat by ourselves too, but we love to go eat with people. And it's not uncommon for us to schedule just with church members on a regular basis. Now, almost every week there's a dinner we're having with somebody. And a lot of times it's just getting to know new people. And Betsy uh, is never at a loss for words. She's really easy conversationalist. And so she helps me a lot with that. And, and is just easy to talk to. And just we always are loving being around people. But that doesn't substitute. For when it's just me and Betsy, the intimacy that we can enjoy, the transparency, the vulnerability that I can have with just Betsy, it's way different than what I can have with other people around. Do you know it's the same way with our Heavenly Father? The personal interaction that we have with Him, and it, don't, I don't want to make it overly spiritual. Sometimes I do this on a walk around my neighborhood. Uh, you know, I like to run sometimes in the morning run, in the darkness of a morning run, if I'm running by myself, that intimacy with God. Yes, I can think and run at the same time, but for some, it, it doesn't have to be. For some of you, your outdoors is where you want to go. For some, there's a place in your house where you can not be distracted and be alone. For some, it's just in your car. Turn off the radio, get, get outward signals away from you, and experience solitude, quiet with God. I want to encourage you, find these practices and put them into play, and you can experience the rest that Jesus offers to us. And thirdly, the third key to finding the rest that Jesus has for us is found in verse 11. It says this, let us therefore strive to enter that rest. Let us strive to enter that rest. That sounds like a paradox. It sounds like it's arguing with itself. You're going to strive or rest, not strive and rest. But that's what he says, strive to enter that rest. What does that mean? Nobody's exactly sure, but as best as we can understand it, that term strive has the idea of 
urgency or purposefulness. It's not a half-hearted. It's saying, go at this rest with everything you have. It seems obvious to me what the writer is saying is, if you want to experience the rest that Jesus has for us, it's not a half-hearted commitment. It's not tipping your toe in the water. That's not the way we come to Jesus in the first place. The only way we experience Jesus is how? It's all in. It's diving all the way in. It's full immersion. It's saying, I'm giving everything I have to Jesus and receiving everything that Jesus has for me in return. We got to strive. We got to give our all to be in this. Our, our baptism, the way we do baptism, is an outward demonstration of this same experience. When somebody gets baptized here, as you've just seen today, they go completely under the water. By the way, Let me say, next Sunday, August 16, we have baptism. If you want to get baptized, you can fill out the digital connect card. If you're watching us online today, you just text connect to 40777, and you fill out the digital connect. I think there's a blank that says, I want more information about being baptized, and we'll contact you today. You can go to our church website as well, firstorlando.com. The front page there has information how you can be baptized. If you've not followed Jesus before, or maybe you have and you're still trying to decide when would be a good time to be baptized, we want you to do it because that's an outward demonstration of what's happening on the inside to find rest. You go all in with Jesus to find rest. It's not partial. But the beautiful thing about it is that when we do that, when we go all in, there's no more struggle. There's no no searching. There's no climbing and reaching and keeping and doing and pretending and hiding and posturing. Now we're completely received and engulfed by the love of Jesus, just like you would be if you dove into a pool. You're completely immersed in his grace and love for us. It's the most beautiful demonstration. So many times we think of God and we think of all the things we got to do and he wants so much from me and I don't know if I can get there and we have this clawing and reaching and climbing mentality that that's what we've got to do to reach God and Jesus is saying no, 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 no. It's not that way. When you come to me you dive in and you rest. You don't have to do that anymore. It's rest. You start from the position of rest. I love Jesus' invitation for this in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28. And I love the way Eugene Peterson puts this in the message. It's a more poetic version in our current language. And this is the way it reads. This is Jesus speaking to us. Are you tired? Worn out? Yeah, I am. Burned out on religion? Yes, yeah, sometimes. Come to me, Jesus says. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me, Jesus says, and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Isn't that a beautiful invitation? That's what Jesus is offering us. And I want to remind you, those of us who are followers of Jesus, this is the life that we are in, and rest is what he offers to us. A beautiful season of rest. No more clawing, no more reaching, no more climbing, no more keeping, no more doing to get God to be pleased with us. His grace is so lavish. His love is so rich. He says, just rest. The greatest rest-giving words ever uttered was when Jesus was on the cross with his arms spread, nailed to the cross. He said these words, it is finished. And he worked so we don't have to. And his work for our redemption was accomplished on the cross. Those are life-giving words. Those are rest-giving words for us. Ephesians 2 Paul says, when we're in Christ, we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. We're seated. It's like we're, we're all here, completely resting on Jesus. We're seated in heavenly places. This is not a position of work. This is a position of rest, receiving what Jesus has for us. Today, if you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and You've never given your life to him. You've never gone all in with Jesus. I want to invite you to do it today. There'd be no better day than today 
to say to him, I give my life to you and I want you to forgive my faults and my ways and my trying to do things on my own and I want to receive everything that you have for me, including the rest that you have for me. Today, I want to invite you to do that. We would love to be able to follow up with you. If you, if you do pray that prayer, you do say that to Jesus, please let us know so that we could follow up with you. For many of us, we're already in this position, but sometimes we forget about it. We forget that we're in a position of rest and not a position of work. Today, I want to remind you what God has done for us, what Jesus has accomplished for us through his death on the cross puts us in the position to be able to rest. And not only that, it puts us in a position to be able to offer rest to others. The greatest privilege and joy we have when we've experienced rest, when we've been to this place where we can sit and feel like, oh, I don't have to earn this anymore, and I don't, I don't have to accomplish, I don't, no more keeping and doing, the, the pressures of that is gone. I'm now resting in who Jesus has, resting spiritually, which provides strength for the emotional challenges of the day and provides a peace for the physical rest that I need. But I want to offer it to somebody else. I want to be a part of a community that says, I know there are people who are suffering today and they're looking for rest and they can't find it because it has to begin in your soul. If you can't find rest in your soul, the, the emotional rest will never come and the physical rest will never come. And today, as a body of Christ, I want to challenge you in the month of September and October, we're going to do a series called Stories of Hope that highlights some different people in the biblical passages that experienced incredible odds against them, and yet they found hope, they found rest. We're going to create conversations, ways for you to create conversation of hope and a conversation of rest, offering life-giving rest and rest-giving conversation to others. We're going to talk to you about how you can participate in that. I want to tell you we can rest and we can offer rest because God's work for our redemption has been completed. His work for us has been done. This past couple weeks I've read a well-known Christian writer who was Chinese. His name is Watchman Nee. He was born in the early 1900s and lived until the mid-1970s. His last 20 years he spent in a Chinese prison because of his fate. During his life, he wrote many books and is largely credited for starting the local church in China, that, uh, all across the, the country there. And Watchman described his coming to Christ at 20 years old. Came to Christ because his mom became a follower and she the way she responded towards him, moved him towards Christ. And he describes the experience himself and said when he imagined, when he was talking to God and asking about salvation, he imagined Jesus on the cross with his arms spread and nails in his hand. But he said to me, it was more like Jesus was welcoming me with his arms wide open saying, come watchman, come to me. And he said, there's no more reaching no more keeping, no more doing, no pretending, no hiding. Jesus is welcoming me. Watchman wrote these words. When we come to Jesus having wasted time and energy, the Father has not a word of rebuke for the waste, nor a word of inquiry regarding our delay. He doesn't sorrow over all that was wasted. He only rejoices over the opportunity our response affords him for giving us more. God is so wealthy that his chief delight is to give. His treasure stores are so full that it is pain to him when we refuse him an opportunity of lavishing those treasures upon us. It is the Father's joy that he could find in us a recipient for the love, the grace, and the mercy that he lavishes upon us. It is a grief to the heart of God when we try to provide things for him. He is so very, very rich. It gives him true joy when we just let him give and give and give again to us. It is a grief to God, too, when we try to do things for him, for he is so very, very able. He longs that we just let him do and do and do again. He wants to be the giver eternally. 
He wants to be the doer eternally. If only we saw how rich and how great he is, we would leave all the giving and all the doing to him. And we would rest. It seems too good to be true, but it's not. Jesus gives us rest. Jesus said, come unto me and I'll give you rest. Let's pray. We enjoy the rest that you offer us. Thank you for letting us be seated with Christ in heavenly places today. Restore us. Refresh us so that we can represent you in every venue, in every place where we live, work, and play. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.